Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, Open Day talk, which is a general interest talk about mathematics. My name is uh, Dr Richard Porter and I'm a lecturer in the School of Mathematics. I've been a lecturer there for about 20 years now. And I'm going to tell you today a little bit about ocean wave energy and how to capture it and the mathematics behind it. So um, let me tell you, give you a bit of an introduction. So I'm an applied mathematician. Uh, mathematicians generally come in three different types. That's the right way of putting it. Statisticians, uh, pure mathematicians and applied mathematicians. And then within applied mathematics, um, I work within the Fluids and Materials Research Group at Bristol, which has a strong history going back many decades. And then I have a particular interest in waves of all types, and that comes under a classification of wave mechanics. But in particular, I'm interested in ocean waves and their interaction with marine structures. Um, and even within that grouping, I have a particular interest in ocean wave renewable energy, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Apart from my research interests, I also um, do all of the usual teaching associated with undergraduates. So um, I teach a third year course on fluid dynamics um, and I supervise undergraduate projects. Um, and those can take the form of research related projects. So for example, I have, I have students who do projects on ocean wave power, but I also have students who do projects on uh, more general topics in applied mathematics, things that I'm interested in and sometimes things that they're interested in. They come up to me and say, I'm really interested in something, can you supervise a project on it? So for example, in the last few years, I've um, supervised projects on how cricket ball swings um, as a student did some computational fluid dynamics to come up with some new results about the optimum speed to bowl a cricket ball at to get it to swing the most. I've done projects on uh, the mathematics of music, again, which is nothing to do with my research interests, and on time trial cycling and how to optimise your time on a, tri on a time tri trial bike. Okay, so a variety of different things that you can do, but I'm going to tell you about wave energy and um, how to convert the energy that you see in ocean waves into usable electricity. So let me tell you how this is done. This is done through mechanical devices, which are called wave energy converters, and they come in lots of different uh, shapes and sizes. And there are lots of different types of and um, ways of um, converting ocean waves into electricity. So I'm just going to give you two examples uh, today, which have come very, very close to being made into fully commercial operations. Um, so full scale prototypes were developed in each case. And the first case I've shown here is um, the Oyster or the Oyster Flap wave energy converter. And this was developed at Queen's University in Belfast and then spun out into a company called Aquamarine Power. And on the left hand side, you can see a cartoon of a array of these uh, devices sitting in shallow water. So they're designed to sit in about 12 meters depth of water, about 500 meters away from the shoreline to a kilometer away from the shoreline. And on the right hand side, you can actually see one of these things after it had been manufactured um, on the dock side in Belfast. Uh, and some, you can see the size of this device compared to the scale of a human down here. So they're about 20 meters um, in height and about 26 meters in length. Um, and the way that this operates is in a fairly sort of intuitive way where we imagine that waves are coming in from um, from right to left, as you see this diagram here, and as the wave passes, the flap is allowed to move backwards and forwards in response to the wave, and as it does so, it drives a piston attached to the uh, bottom of the raft here, and that drives hydraulic fluid round a loop to a pumping station where the electricity is then converted um, from um, the pumping of the fluid. Okay, so that's one example, and I'll come back and talk about that later on. Uh, here's another example that you may have seen recently in the news. So this is uh, called the Palamis device, sometimes referred to as a sea snake device. Um, this was developed um, at Edinburgh University and then spun out into a company associated with that called Ocean Power Delivery. And it's made up of a number of sections, five sections, about 30 meters in length. Again, you can see this diagram here for scale. And these sections are then articulated, and through these articulations, the bending of the difference um, the two, between the two different raft sections 
again pumps hydraulic fluid around a circuit to generate power. So again, when the wave comes past um, this sea snake, um, it rises and falls with the right waves and that generates power. Uh, both of these devices sadly are no longer being um, um, investigated or developed. Um, both companies have essentially folded now due to other factors which I might be able to touch on towards the end of the talk. So ocean wave energy, what is it? Well the first thing to say is that ocean waves are very powerful and you'll see lots of examples of this in media and on the news when storms pass by. So this is um, just a still that I've got from um, a seaside town just outside Bristol called Clevedon. Um, so it's not very far away, it's about 15 miles to cycle there, a beautiful little seaside village or town, it's bigger than a village. And you can see um, what's happening here. And this is along the Bristol Channel, a relatively sheltered part of the ocean. Of course, in the North Atlantic or down towards Cornwall, the waves are a lot uh, more dramatic and a lot more harmful. Uh, than um, in Clevedon, but still you can see the power of them in this picture here. Where does this energy come from? Well, it comes from the wind blowing across the surface of the sea, and it's generated out in the UK. The waves come from the North Atlantic and um, areas of low, um, low pressure depressions that drive um, wave swell, and then the wind blows across with something called fetch, which sort of whips up the wave energy, drives energy into the waves. Um, and these waves can then travel um, a long distance without losing much of its energy. So you can get a wave, for example, traveling from the eastern seaboard of America across to the UK. And you can do a mathematical calculation, in fact, to show that a wave will only lose about um, one to three percent of its energy as it crosses the Atlantic Ocean. OK, so they don't damp the energy in them very easily. And uh, one of the big things about wave energy is that it's extremely energy dense compared to other forms of renewable energy that you all have heard of. So here's some numbers. Um, for example, solar energy generates one kilowatt per meter squared. Wind energy, so that's this diagram that I've got in this cartoon here, wind energy generates about one kilowatt per meter squared as the wind passes across some surface. Um, wave energy contains 25 kilowatts per meter squared. That's a bit of a strange way of um, characterizing it, but I'll, and I'll talk about wave power in it in a mathematical sense in just a second. But you can see it's significantly more energy dense than the other forms of renewable energy that you typically associate with um, generating uh, renewable energy. And I like this sketch because it sort of shows you why this is the case. So here's, here's the wind out to sea, and this occupies volume, it occupies three-dimensional space. And then if you think about a wind turbine, the way that a wind turbine works is that the, um, the turbines or the rotors spin round and, and um, sketch out a two-dimensional surface, and they take essentially a two-dimensional slice of three-dimensional energy. Okay, um, but Wave energy is a lot more concentrated, and I'll show you why now. So the wind blows across the surface of the sea. The wind occupies volume, three-dimensional space. It transits, transfers its energy onto the surface of the sea, which is a two-dimensional object. And then the waves propagate towards the shoreline and then hit the, the coastline, and a line is a one-dimensional object. And so you've concentrated energy from three-dimensional space through a two-dimensional surface onto a one-dimensional coastline. And that's one of the reasons that they're so energy dense. Okay, so what can mathematics, where does mathematics come into all of this? And it's a complicated subject and we can't go into all of the details. Um, the first thing to say is how do we actually use mathematics to model waves? And if you go and sort of sit on some harbour and look out to sea, you'll see that waves are actually quite complicated and you can't capture all of the compli complications in an easy mathematical model of water waves. But that's not what a mathematician does. The mathematician says, well, OK, I want to put a wave energy converter somewhere out to sea. I don't need the complication of crashing and breaking waves. I just need to know what the waves look like uh, a kilometre, two kilometres out um, out to sea from the shoreline. And if you look carefully at the sea, you can see that there are patterns. The waves just rise and fall in a regular way. 
Okay, and so a mathemat mathematical modeler, and this is the skill of an applied mathematician, is to try and ignore the detail that you don't need and concentrate only on the things that you absolutely need to keep. Okay, so we're just looking at these patterns, the rising and falling of water waves. So we think of it in some sense like a child would think of a water wave when we start sketching what a water wave might look like. Okay, and so this is my little sketch. And if I said to you, well, what does the surface of the sea look like? Well, you might draw a little picture like this. It looks relatively rough, but there are some kind of patterns in amongst this roughness. And the way that we kind of decode this is we say, well, it's a superposition. That is, it's a sum of lots of different wavelengths sort of falling over on top of one another. So in this, in this um, signature of this wave that I've written up here, I'm going to say that somehow it's a sum of a long wave and a medium wave and a shorter wave. And you can, if you play a musical instrument, a stringed instrument, the waves that are generated on your stringed instrument are just a superposition of these types of waves. So there are analogues in things that you will have seen before. And, but this is how we think of it mathematically. We think of as real C as being some kind of superposition of lots of different waves of different heights, different wavelengths, um, and so on. And what do these waves that I've drawn look like? Well, mathematically, they look like functions that you will have come across. They look like sine and cosine functions, okay? And we don't say, therefore, that's what waves are. What we do is we actually say, what are the mathematics that tell us that this must be the case? So this next slide says it can't really be that easy, that they are just sines and cosines. And my answer to that is, well, yes, it is actually that easy. And well, no, it isn't. So here's the easy bit. The surface actually is a superposition of cosines or sines. And the way that I've drawn the surface here, as I say, the surface is a function. This is something that you perhaps won't have seen at school. You'll have seen functions of a function of x, y of x, or f of x. But the, the surface is both a function of space and time, and that's the way we write it mathematically. And that function is just a cos, okay, with some amplitude or some height. H is the, the wave height from trough to peak. Okay, and then it's got some spatial variation. So if I take a photograph in time, Okay, it has a wavelength associated with it, and I've used the Greek letter lambda here for the wavelength. Okay, so it repeats itself, every, this cosine repeats itself every time I move forward by a distance lambda. And the wave also has a period associated with it, so it oscillates, it comes back every, um, and I've used t for the period here. So every t seconds I see the same thing happening, and that defines the period. Okay, and so every time T advances by capital T, I get back to the same picture. Okay, so this actually represents a wave traveling from left to right, and there's some shift in here, signified by the Greek letter delta. So that means I can shift the origin backwards and forwards. It's not fixed at the origin. Okay, so that's actually mathematically how you describe one of the components that makes up the total number of waves in a real sea. Um, and we don't impose this, we don't say that's what we need to have because that's what we see. This simple result comes from mathematics and mathematical modeling. And so it actually comes from things that you will see in your second and third year of your mathematics course called partial differential equations. And these partial differential equations, which describe how a fluid moves, come from fundamental physical principles, such as conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. This is like Newton's law for a fluid. Okay, so these are complicated things, but what I'm trying to say is that these simple structures that I've just talked about aren't just my invention. They come as part of the solutions of something rather more complicated and founded in mathematics. And you see this stuff during your course. I teach this, I so say the, the, the theory of ocean waves gets taught as part of the fluid dynamics course in your third year, but it builds on material that you see on your first and your second year on courses in mechanics, on calculus, multivariable calculus and differential equations and so on. Okay, back to um, power. How much power does a, a wave 
possess. Um, and it turns out that you can do a calculation based upon the theory that I've just described. And this is the mathematical formula for a, the power of a wave of height h and of period t. Okay, it doesn't actually involve lambda because lambda and t are connected to one another in a non-trivial way. So this power formula also depends upon g. g here is gravity because waves are only because there are, you can't have waves in space, ocean waves in space. It's gravity that drives the rise and the fall of the surface. And rho here, this Greek letter rho, is the density. And when you plug in these numbers here, it turns out that this is, the power is approximately h squared t in kilowatts. And I'll tell you why this is important in just a second. In fact, right now, okay, if you do the calcul if you do the measurements and the calculations, it turns out that in a really powerful spot of the UK, off the west coast of uh, Scotland, up in the Highlands, um, the, the amount of energy arriving at the shoreline is about 30 kilowatts per kilometre of coastline. So if you stand on the beach and you uh, measure out uh, one metre of sand, you've got about 30 kilowatts of power coming towards you just on that one metre. And if the beach is um, that you're standing on is a kilometre in length, a thousand metres in length, then the total amount of energy would be 30 megawatts of energy just arriving on that beach. Okay, and then if you scale this across the whole of um, the world, it turns out that this is just an approximation that there's about 12 terawatts, that's 12,000 gigawatts, reaching the coastlines worldwide. Okay, now this diagram over here is a little bit complicated, but it's going to tell you the problem, the problem with wave power, why it doesn't work, why we haven't got these things floating out to sea when you go down to the beach, why you see wave turbine, where you see wind turbines, and you see solar farms, but you don't see wave energy converters. And the problem lies here in this diagram. So in this diagram, we have down here period, and across here, no, sorry, this is period across the top, and this is wave height. And this is what's called a probability distribution. All of the numbers in this graph here, if you sum them all together, add up to 100. And these are called probability bins. And this is the chance that a, a wave of a certain height, remember it's all the waves are a superposition, a wave of a certain height and a certain period will um, come to the coastline. So here it's saying that the most likely wave that you will see in this particular, this is a particular setting, I think this is the North Atlantic somewhere, is that the most likely scenario is that your wave height will be um, 0.75 and your period will be 4.5 seconds. That's 0.75 meters and 4.5 seconds. So this red patch here is where, you, where a lot of the energy is. Okay, so when you're designing your wave energy converter, you want to be able to get it to operate around this area here. So this area here is about, I think probably about 20 kilowatts per meter. Um, of course, when you average over this whole thing, you get to 30 kilowatts per meter because over here, things get more powerful. But the real problem is over here, this bottom corner. Here we have a wave of 11.25 meters with a period of 12 and a half seconds. So this is a very long swell wave. Okay, and this doesn't happen very often. But the trouble is, is that because of this formula over here, okay, that it's h squared times t, if I double t, I double the amount of power. And if I double h, I quadruple the amount of power. And if I double h and double t, then I've got eight times the amount of power. And so this bin over here, if you do the calculation, is about 200 times as much power as where you actually want to be. So the trouble is, is that you want to design a wave energy converter to operate over here, but it has to be able to withstand 200 times that amount of power. And that's a really difficult thing to do. If you're trying to design something to withstand a force that's 200 times the way that it's supposed to operate, that's really tricky. And that's basically the reason why wave energy is difficult.
So there, there, that's what I've said, a big problem. How can maths help in the design of wave energy converters? So I'm going to give you two examples. Um, and this one here is called the Bristol Cylinder. It was invented actually by my PhD supervisor back in um, the 1970s. And this is a cross section through something which comes out of the page at you. So it's a long cylinder which is submerged beneath um, the surface of the ocean and it's connected to the bottom just like the oyster flap was um, by a complicated mechanical arrangement and this is essentially the reason that the Bristol cylinder didn't work. This, this stuff that you see down the bottom is too complicated. And the Bristol cylinder, this is an actual engineering diagram from the early 1980s. It was almost built, I mean it was really really close to being built at the time. Um, this is a massive cylinder, it's 16 metres in diameter, so this is a really big operation that you see here. But the cylinder is designed to be able to move up and down and left to right. Okay, So it can move in both degrees of freedom, up, down, left and right. And um, it's, a, it's a very, very neat mathematical result, um, and I can't go into the deep mathematics of why it happens, but I can show you sort of the principle behind it, which is this. As it goes up and down, now, okay, so forget about waves coming in for the time being, okay? I just want you to do a thought experiment. Imagine taking this cylinder and just moving it up and down. And what you would generate is you would generate a symmetric wave pattern. Okay, what would happen on three meters to the right would be exactly the same as what happened three meters to the left. You'd have symmetry in the waves, okay? Because you're moving a symmetric object up and down. And that's designated by this blue line here. That's my symmetric waves going out due to me moving it up and down. Then if I do the same experiment independently and I move it left and right, okay, what happens is that um, the waves on the right are out of phase by half a period with the waves on the left. That means that I'm going to generate what's called an anti-symmetric sig signal and that's designated by this red line here. Okay, so that's an odd function. What happens on the right is out of phase with what happens on the left. And if I combine these um, two motions, you can see it's a physical principle of constructive and destructive interference. On the right-hand side, I've got constructive interference, and I get twice the amount of waves going out to the right. And on the left-hand side, I destroy the waves, I've got destructive interference and nothing goes to the left. Okay, now here's the clever part. Okay, now I do something which you can do with mathematics. You reverse time. Instead of moving this object up and down and left and right, and in fact the way that you have to do it is you have to phase it, so in fact it moves around in a circular pattern. The combined mo motion is circular. Um, but if I just now reverse time, what I'm going to have, instead of a wave going out, I'm going to have a wave coming in. The cylinder is going to move in this phased circular motion, and nothing will go back out to the right or to the left. So the wave has come in, the cylinder has moved around, and all of the energy must have been um, absorbed. And so you get 100% wave energy captured by the Bristol cylinder, theoretically. Okay, so a very neat mathematical result that was derived by a mathematician. Okay, I'm a bit late with that thing at the bottom there. Okay, what can you do? And this is my second example. So you can be part of this story. You can be part of um, investigating wave energy and trying to make wave energy a useful thing. This is a picture of my um, ex-PhD student. And in fact, she did an undergraduate project with me on wave power before that. Uh, and she looked into... Um, initially at least into the oyster flap uh, and looked at the mathematics behind that. So at the time Oyster was a commercial company and they were developing prototypes and I thought it would be a nice mathematical exercise to see why and how it worked mathematically. And it turns out because of the Oyster device and how it works it, it only has this left-right motion, it doesn't have the up-down motion and that means that mathematically you can prove that you can only extract 50% of the incoming power, not 100% as we showed for the, the Bristol cylinder. Um, and then you have to come across the fact that these theoretical results are for 
um, devices which are infinitely long. And of course, nothing is infinitely long. These things are long, but they have a finite length to them. And you're interested now in optimizing the power per unit length. So this is what Imogen looked at, and this is one of her computations from uh, PhD. Um, and there's, there's some labels on here, which I'm going to try and explain to you now because I haven't got a legend on here. But essentially, this is the length of the device. And we're trying to optimize the length of the device. And the heat map here and this scale shows you the amount of power that you can get out in some units that I don't need to go into. So basically, the brightest spot on here is the point at which you want to design your oyster wave energy um, device. So this is the computation that Imogen made and she looked at the data and it turned out that she wanted to be about here. So she predicted that the oyster flap needed to be about 26 meters long in order um, to get the maximum power per unit length out of that. And this just came from a mathematical calculation. And to show you how useful mathematics is, this is what the company um, Aquamarine Power did. They developed their first prototype, which was called the Oyster One, and they made it 18 meters in length. And they put it out to sea, put it into sea trials, and they realized it wasn't working as well as, as they wanted it to. And so they produced a second prototype, the Oyster Two, and they made it slightly longer. They made it 24 meters, and then it did work as they wanted it to. And so, as you can see, our mathematical calculations were very close to what um, people were actually doing at some huge expense creating prototypes where mathematics would have given you the optimal uh, value. So as I said, um, where are these wave energy converters? It's a very tricky balance to produce lots of power and make sure that the thing can't, isn't just um, broken up by the first storm that comes and, and, and um, rips this thing off the seabed. There are lots of other problems. The installation, operation and maintenance are very difficult. Um, in recent years, the reason that Oyster and um, Palamis have failed have actually primarily because of the, the huge reduction in cost of other renewables. Wind and solar are now cheaper, the cheapest form of energy production out of all types, including coal and gas. Um, but there is still a need because of the reliability of wave. It's always there. There are always waves on the ocean. The wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't sh always shine. And so um, wave energy is still seen as being a, an important part of the, the mix and people are still investing heavily in R&D into wave energy. Um, and so there's still things to be done and there are still things for mathemati mathematicians to do. And um, a lot of the mathematical theories are in three dimensions. I've only told you about two dimensional results here, whether or not you've understood that. <laughs> that's. Um, I'll let you be the judge of that. Um, but there are limits on three-dimensional devices, um, theoretical limits. And um, the real challenge now is how to try and think about wave energy to break those limits, to try and make wave energy renewables more efficient than they currently are. And so this is part of my current research. And like when I say like now, I mean literally mean like now, like like. An hour ago, I was researching exactly into this. And so if you come to Bristol and you do potentially do a project on uh, wave power with me and other researchers are doing similarly exciting things, um, you can be part of the story of you know developing um, something for the future. OK, well, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, brief run through and found it interesting. Um, and um, I hope you have a good open day looking around all of the other things that Bristol has to offer. Okay, bye.